Jeremy Pruitt is taking what uh, he does best, and of course, he's now doing it for his own program at Tennessee in his first uh, full recruiting cycle here in the 2019 recruiting class. And of course, this is early signing day, which has become the primary signing day as of last December. We got Mike Laval on the on uh, the line from Last Word on College Football to break down the balls. Uh, Mike, how you doing tonight? Mark, doing fantastic. Always a pleasure to join you on Mark Rogers TV. Absolutely. Uh, Jeremy Pruitt um, has his work cut out in front of him in regards to the competition in the division. That's the obvious um, challenge there with what Georgia is doing um, next to Alabama. Uh, Florida had a great day, uh, but quietly, uh, it seems as though he's making inroads as well. Yeah, Jeremy Pruitt, I think, had a solid day. You know, I think if you had to grade it, it'd be a, a solid B, probably maybe even a B plus. Uh, you know, it's solid foundation. Uh, I think today the early signing period is going to be the highlight for Tennessee. Uh, what we don't know is what the uh, late signing period, the February signing period, is going to look like. 17 early signees today. Eight of those are going to be early enrollees. That only gives Pruitt and his staff three more commits who have not signed with Tennessee. That brings to a total of 20. Uh, you know, I think Pruitt and staff would like to get to about 24, 25. Uh, they had one offensive lineman uh, re medically retire this week. They had one linebacker, Corte Sapp, uh, declare for the NFL draft. So they had a little bit of uh, extra room for the scholarships open up in the last two weeks. I think their goal is 25. Right now they have 17 signed LOIs today. Uh, I think we're going to get one more tomorrow and Eric Gray and then three hard commits. That brings us to 21. Uh, so, you know, I think they're looking for four or five, possibly more guys for the February signing period. I think the early signing period for Tennessee is going to be much stronger than the February signing period. But a good day, solid day for Pruitt and his staff as far as recruiting goes, like you mentioned, with those headwinds that he faces there in Knoxville, not only the competition in the SEC and geography, but going up against a 9 and a nine and 15 record over the last two years. Absolutely. So he has to uh, recruit the the concept that has yet to be proven versus the proof of concept uh, that many of his competitors can boast at this point in Kirby Smart being front and center. I see where 10 of the uh, commits slash signees come from the state of Georgia. We've talked about uh, the uh, abundance of talent there. Yeah, certainly Jeremy Pruitt made uh, an excellent show in Georgia. Most of those are in the Atlanta area. Of course, uh, the, the top few guys, Wanya Morris, five-star, uh, coming from Grayson, which is a traditional power down in southeast Georgia. And then Ramil Keaton from Marietta in the Atlanta area. The interesting from Keaton is he plays at Marietta in the 2020 class. I believe they have five or six guys in the top 150 of the 247 rankings on that one team to include Tennessee's quarterback commit for 2020, Harrison Bailey. So uh, so when you look at the top three guys and then uh, their tight end, Jackson Lowe, played at Cartersville in Georgia there in the Atlanta area, same high school that produced Trevor Lawrence two years ago. He was a, uh, a teammate of Trevor Lawrence. So when you look at the top six guys for Tennessee, uh, all of them except for two from the Georgia area, and most of them from powerhouse programs. So it's clear that Pruitt has that Pruitt adheres to that kind of old recruiting adage of establishing pipelines to powerhouse programs, establishing those good quality relationships with high school coaches, and, and then going uh, and to go go into the areas where the talent uh, the talent rich areas. And there's uh, probably no one particular city in America that produces. Uh, college football talent uh, like the Atlanta area. Tremendous talent there. It's, it's on par with Texas and Southern California uh, as those uh, big recruiting areas. Butch Jones uh, ultimately failed on the field at Tennessee. He did bring in recruiting classes that were ranked anywhere from five to the lower teens during his tenure there. Many of those were defections, unfortunately. Uh, Jeremy Pruitt, I'm thinking, may not be able to contend for a college football playoff spot with classes ranked in the 20 to 25 range, but he can certainly win eight and nine games if the coaching and the development are there. Do you see any difference between the classes and the, the approach of a Jeremy Pruitt versus a Butch Jones? 
Certainly. Not only do I see a difference, I think they're diametrically opposed as to the philosophies. I think with Butch Jones, what he did is he went out and recruited the highest ranked players he could find, brought them into the program and tried to shape the program around the players that he brought in. I think with Jeremy Pruitt, he has a blueprint of the program he wants, and he will go out and find the players that he thinks fit into that program. So I think they're diametrically opposed as to the approach of, of how they recruit the players vis-a-vis, vis-a-vis the program. With Butch Jones, it was player first, we'll mold the program. With, with Jeremy Pruitt, I think it's program first, we'll go out and find the right players. The other issue is, like you talked about, talent development. When you look at the guys that Butch Jones brought in, whether it's Alvin Kamara, um, um, uh, Joshua Dobbs, um, uh, Jalen Hurd, uh, Derek Barnett, those guys, uh, you did not see a lot of progress from where they were when they entered the program to when they went to the NFL. The amount of talent that Tennessee has in the NFL right now is, is amazing considering what that team didn't do uh, when Butch Jones was here. I think with Jeremy Pruitt, you're going to look at a guy who's not going to recruit a top five class, at least for the first three or four years, but you're going to see a team that maybe – produces at a level much higher compared to their recruiting rank than the Tennessee teams under Butch Jones. While they had high recruiting rankings, they didn't get it done on the field. It's that development of the talent once you get it into the program that was missing with Butch Jones. I think with Jeremy Pruitt, you're going to see a better development of the talent once it gets into the program, and the product on the field is going to be more reflective of the recruiting ranks than you saw under Butch Jones. Alvin Kamara would be the most obvious example. I don't know that he's the best example, but the most obvious example of that, because if you asked your average college football fan, even if asked me while Alvin Kamara was at Tennessee and I watched him play a lot of football, did I think he was a good player? Absolutely. He was a good player. Did I expect him to be a superstar in the NFL? Not based on what I saw at Tennessee. Yeah, I mean, you can go down the list. In the secondary, you got Cameron Sutton playing for the Steelers. Justin Coleman uh, was with the Patriots. I think he's with the uh, uh, Panthers now. All these guys are contributing. John Kelly is the backup of the Rams. Alvin Kamara having a great, great, another great season with the Saints. Uh, Joshua Dobbs beat out um, uh, the, the the other guy for the uh, Joshua Dobbs uh, won the backup uh, role there at the Steelers. Um, you, you have the. Jalen Hurd, who, of course, left, uh, had an all-conference season at Baylor. Uh, you have the former receiver at Tennessee, who's now the two or three, uh, one of the top three receivers with the Bengals. You know, those are the teams that won like seven and eight games at Tennessee. And you have you Derek Barnett uh, with the Eagles. Uh, you, you you literally have a, a team that went that had seven wins three years ago, half of which are in the NFL now, almost half of which are in the NFL now. Jalen Reeves, Maben uh, with the Lions. I mean, you I mean, you just you just start. Uh, naming those names and that how did that team only win seven games in the regular season it's amazing uh so so i think what you're going to see under jeremy pru is much more a much better talent development of the talent they get into the program while they're in knoxville josh malone of course the uh, cincinnati Bengals wide receiver that's who i thought yeah. it was but just double checked on that one yeah, could, embarrassing. That I couldn't think of his name. He's from my hometown as well. Well, this is what happens. You've got how many names uh, rattling up there, and, and you forget sometimes the most obvious ones I do as well. All right. Uh, all we have to do is look at the star rankings to determine who the guys are supposed to turn out to be the most impactful on this team. But is there any under lying storylines in regards to maybe some guys that uh, were missing or guys that you liked based on um, some of the, um, the the tape that you've seen or what you've heard? Yeah, pr- pretty solid uh, pretty solid class today with the 17 signings. All three stars are above. Uh, so there's I don't really think there's anybody who's really under the radar. But if I had to pick of the three stars that signed today, if I had to pick three guys, I think Elijah Simmons is pretty interesting. He's a defensive tackle. Right now he's coming in at about 350 pounds. Uh, Jeremy Pruitt talked about him in his press conferences today. Uh, told him that he wanted to get him down to 325 pounds. Simmons come back and, and I guess sent him a, sent Coach uh, Pruitt a tape of him dunking. Uh, any man uh, who is six foot, 350 pounds, can still dunk a basketball. That that's a big frame. That's an athletic body. He's a defensive tackle in, in a three four scheme. He can really clog up. He can really help in that run defense. Clog up two or three of those running lanes, either from the tackle position or more likely from the nose guard position. 
So I, I can't wait to see what happens with Elijah Simmons. He's not from a big time program, Pearl Cone in Nashville. It's a decent sized school, uh, but, but, but isn't a Grayson, isn't a Marietta, isn't a Cartersville, uh, or isn't even a Riverdale or Oakland or Black, uh, Blackman there in Nashville. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what happens with him, with his development once he gets in there. Warren Burrell, North Gwinnett uh, in, in Georgia, another kind of outskirts of Atlanta. Uh, he's a little bit undersized, six foot 170. Uh, I think his frame, I think there's a lot of potential for his frame to put on 15 or 20 pounds. I like his athleticism at cornerback on the corner, and I like his attitude. He brings uh, that attacking attitude to the cornerback position that you really like to have. He's one of those guys that I think is as good against the run defense as he is in the coverage. And then when you look at the quarterback, uh, Brian Maurer out of uh, Ocala, Florida. Uh, Harrison Bailey, again, I told you he's a 2020 commit. You have JT Shroud in there now uh, as kind of the two guys who are a little bit more shiny objects uh, behind Jarrett Guarantano. But when you look at Brian Maurer's film, tremendous arm strength and tremendous accuracy. Uh, you know, he's, he's just one of those guys that uh, can control the football, particularly on the deep balls. Uh, so I think he's kind of a little bit underrated as a quarterback prospect, three-star quarterback prospect uh, coming into Knoxville. He's got good size, 6'3", uh, 200 pounds. You think, you, you'd like to think that once he gets into the program uh, as an early enrollee, he can maybe uh, bulk up his frame a little bit, get to 6'3", maybe 215 is a good size for a quarterback in the SEC. So those, three, those are the three guys, uh, the three of the three stars who I think might be able to uh, I- impact the program more than people see right now. Mike Laval from Last Word on College Football helping us break down the Vols on this uh, newly formed at National Signing Day, the early edition, which has become the primary edition with uh, approximately 220 of the top 300 players signed last year in December and about uh, just under 80% of the Power 5 players signed. The last I saw on the tote board for today was roughly 1,400 FPS players signed. Yeah, I think fans are going to have to get used to this uh, the, the new way of, of seeing success, uh, team success. And I think what what fans are really going to learn this year is uh, that with with the majority of guys signing early in, in the December period instead of the February period, there's going to be kind of a, a different a different approach to the February period where teams, you know, a team like Tennessee is a good example uh, where they're going to have to go with these guys. So you look at Darnell Wright and Quervarius Crouch, uh, who are still top names out there, teams like Tennessee who, who are who are clawing and fighting to stay in the fight, to stay in that top 20, to stay in that top 15, to stay in competitive, to stay competitive in top conferences, you know, they're going to have to go hard uh, it's, it's, it one, it's, it's some of these few remaining four- and five-star guys. It's going to be interesting to see how the recruiting game changes for that February signing period now that we're in the, fir- the second full season of the two periods. And I think it's going to be interesting to see how hard they go after those guys. And then of the, of the three stars remaining, how does that affect them at the schools they go to? Because like you said, I think there's only – uh, you know, there's there's only going to so for Tennessee, there's only going to be two or three spots left. We think we're going to get gray tomorrow. That'll be 21, including our commits. And then, you know, if we get lucky and get right and crouch, so that'll put us at 23. So if you're one of those mid to low three stars, you know, you're looking at schools. Every school you're looking at only has two or three spots left. Where are you going to fit in? Uh, that's really going to cause. Uh, some concern and uh, problems for those mid to low three star guys who are trying to hold out for a a power five or a dream school offer. It's going to be interesting to see how the the February uh, recruiting period is affected by teams and by players based on the the um, the importance uh, and the primacy now of the December signing period. I think fans are going to have to get used to that. All right, there's the take from Tennessee camp with Mike Laval from Last Word on College Football. We've got Kevin McGuffey coming up from Last Word on College Football a little bit later tonight to talk Kentucky. Uh, I am on here all night, every uh, 20 to 30 minutes with a new guest. And uh, Mike, we appreciate you stopping by and uh, giving us the take on Tennessee. Always a pleasure to join you, Mark. Please, uh, for all those people watching, we, you know, we did profiles of all the four and five stars at Tennessee. Check it out on www.lastwordoncollegefootball.com, or you can just go straight to my Twitter feed at Mike L underscore LWOS and, and, get, and go directly to those articles. Appreciate you having us on, Mark, as always.